Peace be with you. I was waiting for you. So we begin with a prayer tonight. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much again for the, the gift of the Eucharist and the gift of worshiping you through the holy sacrifice of the Mass. We thank you for making us <clears throat> partakers of the sacrifice of Jesus through our communion in his body and blood and for adopting us as your children and filling us with your Holy Spirit to continue the, the ministry and presence of Jesus in the world, to continue ex expanding the kingdom of God among us and especially within our, each one of our hearts. We just pray you continue to open our hearts, our minds tonight, to grow in a deeper understanding and a, therefore also a deeper love of, um, of the Holy Mass and the truth behind many of the prayers, and the signs and symbols, um, that we do so we can keep growing, learning why we do what we do and just keep growing in a deeper knowledge and love of you and sharing that, that knowledge and love with those around us. So we just pray you'd open our hearts, open our minds in a special way. Send your Holy Spirit to lead and guide us tonight um, for in the teaching and in the understanding. We pray these together in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, so we begin our fourth talk on the four parts of the Mass. We did the introductory rite, the liturgy of the Word, and we began the liturgy of the Eucharist last time. And we'll finish the liturgy of the Eucharist tonight and then move on to the fourth part, um, basically the concluding rites. And so we'll try to just remind our ourselves where we are. So in this part of the Mass, we <clears throat> did Tom's favorite part and took up the collection, uh, the collection of, the, of, the, of each one of our, the offerings of our lives brought forward through the, the bread and the wine and by the people to Christ and the priest who brought them up forward and um, united them with his own body and blood, his own self-offering and offered the whole Christ, all of us with Christ to the Father uh, for the salvation of the world, for our salvation, for the salvation of those the past, present, future. Um, <clears throat> so it's a, a mystery, weird mystery there that we get to, we're already beginning to enter into and participate in this passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Um, <clears throat> that's how St. Paul refers to the Eucharist, participating in the body and blood of Christ, sacrificed and offered for us. And we are, we know when we, we began this Eucharistic liturgy here, we began to, in a sense, transcend time. Uh, the past, 2,000 years ago, we, we becomes present for us here and now. So Calvary becomes right here as Christ is sacrificed before us and his sacrifice took place and, and first his body and then his blood. And remember the consecrations were separate because when the blood is taken out of the body, then the body is dead. And so this is with the, the separation, the, the separate consecration of body and blood, uh, there is, that's the death. So the death of Christ right here on Calvary. And you will see, and they're in the communion time when the priest breaks the bread, puts a little piece back in there, unites the body and the blood together. That's the sign in the mass of the resurrected life, resurrection. So we're, it, we're here, we just finished the consecration. The, the, we're two, the 2,000 years in the past has come right in the present moment. And um, we have sacrificed Jesus Christ, offered the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the world and for the world. This is our symbol here. And so now what we're about to do, and, and also just remembering, we're participating in the worship that's, that's in heaven with all the saints and angels. So we're participating in their worship service. So heaven and earth have collided or interconnected right there. Um, so, so we are surrounded by angels and saints, not just the normal angels that we're surrounded by every day, like our guardian angels, protection angels, worship angels, but all the, all the heavenly hosts are present with us during this, this time in the Mass. And uh, so we're, we've, just caught, we've just sacrificed, uh, offered the sacrifice of Jesus to the Father, now for the world, so now we're about to pray Go kind of go through and pray more specifically for the church and, and for the world and for those who have died. So that's what we find in this next part of the Mass, those specific prayers. 
So <clears throat> we pick up, um, we, for instance, we just proclaimed the mystery of faith, and we said, we proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. And then we pick up with the rest of the Eucharistic prayer. So now we're about to pray for all of us gathered here first. So listen, and it says, therefore, therefore, since we have just offered the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the salvation of the world here on this altar, therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, so we remember the Jewish uh, understanding of memorial there is not just, oh, I remember with my mind, but anamnesis, which means I, I go, I enter into that point in time and participate in that point in time in such a way that now I can say I, I was there, I have been there. So it's just like when the Jews would celebrate the Passover for the first time, before they celebrate the Passover for the first time, they might say, oh, my ancestors or my fathers, you know, when they did the Passover. But as soon as they celebrate the Passover meal for the first time in anamnesis, in memorial, after that, time, after that Passover, they say, my fathers and me were there. We experienced this. We were rescued from, by, or by God from all these uh, false gods and from these plagues. God rescued us. God brought us through the Red Sea, you know. So th that's what anamnesis brings us into this great mystery this, uh, of this past event that God has done. And so when we say, therefore, as we celebrate the memorial, the anamnesis of his death and resurrection, uh, if we've celebrated Mass before, we say, we were there on Calvary with him, you know. John wasn't the only disciple. We were there with him now, <laughs> with Mary, the foot of the cross, and the other women. So in anamnesis, we enter into that place and time and celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus. We offer you, O Lord. So Father, we're, we're talking about our, the Lord as Father. We offer you the bread of life. So a title of Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup will um, never die. You know, we'll have life forever. Uh, but whoever does not will have no life in you. So that's all John chapter 6, Eucharistic teaching for us. The bread of life discourse is called sometimes Jesus, our bread of life. And the chalice of salvation. Remember, he said to his apostles, you know, can you drink the chalice that I'm going to drink? <laughs> or he said, you know, and, and when he's um, in the garden, before he's arrested, he says, Father, take this chalice <laughs> away from me. <laughs> so the bread of life, we offer you, O Lord, the bread of life. And the, so we're offering you to you, Lord, the bread of life, the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy. So our Father holds us worthy to be in your presence. God allows us to be in his presence without striking us down. We're worthy. And to minister to you, to serve you. We're ser and what are we serving him? Like, think about waiters in a restaurant. We're serving him what he has offered us. Remember his, his son, the body and blood of his son. And our lives with the life of his son. So... Since you have lifted us up and counted us worthy to be in your presence and to minister to you, to serve you, humbly we pray. So we kind of lower ourselves back down. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and the blood of Christ, so partaking of the body and blood of Christ, remember, again, what we just, we just said, Paul says, when we partake of this uh, body and blood of Christ, we are we are participating in the death and resurrection of Jesus. We're participating in the body and blood of Christ, his death and resurrection. So again, there's the, the tie also to anamnesis. We're not just remembering with our mind. We are actually participating in that life event. Partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. So first we're acknowledging that we're entering into this one event. And now we're here with Christ, united with him, and we're thanking God that he gives 
He makes, allows us to be worthy, to be in his presence and minister to him. And now we're praying for the unity, for our unity. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. So we're praying for the unity of believers. First and foremost, the ones who are gathered here at this event to celebrate this Holy Mass. The ones who are making the self-offering. That we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. So remember, again, we, we have said before, if we're just paying attention at the Mass and listening to what's saying, we're learning about our faith. So we learn right here, one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit is to gather us together into one, to form unity. That's one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit. And so that's our prayer. Bring it, gather us here together into one. And now we, begin to, now we begin to pray for the whole church. Remember, Lord, your church. So first we we're kind of praying for unity for all of us just gathered here. Now we're going to pray for the whole church around the world. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the whole world. Not just your church right here, but your church everywhere. And bring her to the fullness of charity. So that kind of needs to be our prayer sometimes. So for, to the fullness of charity, to complete perfect love. You now we were made for, God, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. Our love needs to become perfect, needs to become uh, full, complete. This is a, the Hebrew author um, touches on this when he talks about Jesus Christ, how he was made perfect by his suffering, by what he suffered. I think, how could he be made perfect? It's not like, it's not being made sinless, it's being made mature. It, the love being made mature, being fully complete by a full, complete self-offering. So we're praying for the whole church around the world that all of us, that our love would be made full and complete being able to become a full, complete self-offering to the Father, holding nothing back. Love is perfect, it is complete, it is doing what it was made to do when, it is, when love is full and holds nothing back. And you know, so that's, our, that's our, the goal, that's the, the love that we want. The love that God has, the love that the scriptures call the agape love, the all-in love. So we're praying that God would complete uh, his love inside each and every one of us, his whole church around the world. So we just prayed for the whole church, clergy and the laity, and now we're going to pray specifically for the leaders of the church, that they would lead us the right way. <laughs> yeah. So first we pray for the whole church. Now we say, together, so bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, Robert, our Bishop, and the other auxiliary bishops in the local community, and all the clergy. So all the leaders, we prayed for all the whole church, uh, laity and clergy, now we're praying specifically for the leaders. They need extra help, the extra bullseye on them, you know, they're under extra attack, they take the hit first, you know. Uh, if, if they go astray, the whole, if the whole, if, if the, what's it called, when that, the, the rudder of the ship, you know, if, the, if it goes off a little bit, the whole ship goes off course, you know? So if the leaders are going off course, the whole, the church is going with them, you know? We're not gonna make any modern day comments. <laughs> so we're, we know we, it's extra important. Not that they're spe extra special. And we don't pray for them because we think they're extra special. Uh, we're praying for them because they have extra needs. It's extra important that they lead us the right direction. So we pray for the, everybody, and especially the leaders. And then we move on, and there's this optional section that where we offer a prayer during, for funerals or weddings. The so optional s section here where we offer a prayer for the spouses who were just married or for the person who is deceased at their funeral. This is just the extra prayers, extra blessings that God would unite them to Jesus Christ um, for that occasion. And then we move on to pray for the dead. 
So we prayed for all of us. We've thanked God that he's allowed us all to be here in his presence, to minister to him and serve him, uh, our lives with the life of Christ. And we have prayed for all of us, for all believers, but especially those gathered here to be one by the power of the Holy Spirit. We prayed for the whole church around the whole world, especially the leaders, that they would lead and guide us the right direction. And now we're gonna pray for all those who have died. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection. So beautiful, again, we've said before, beautiful way to look at death, the Christian perspective of death as falling asleep. Remember our brothers and sisters, there were one family, so our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of resurrection. They've fallen asleep in the arms of Christ or in the loving arms of our Heavenly Father. And we can just always picture that, what's happening in sleep as they're resting and being refreshed and being healed, all the things that happen to us when we sleep, you know, and how wonderful it is. Probably our father says how wonderful it is when, when the children are sleeping because they're so quiet, you know, there's no crying, no whining, no complaining, no drama, you know. So God is happy when we sleep, you know. Because also, when, when think about when babies sleep in your arms, they they just kind of they're all they just relax. They just you know dead. They're just body weight, right? And they just open for whatever you're going to do to them. However you want to love on them or hold them real close, you can kiss them all over, and they don't know resistance, right? So like when we're sleeping, uh, when we've fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection in the arms of Jesus Christ, in the arms of our heavenly Father, we're not resisting God's love anymore like we do on earth. We're just open to receive and be loved on. So there's extra healing that takes place so quick right there that prepares us. All the wounds that we've gone through, those wounds get healed by the gaze of our Heavenly Father who gazes upon us and loves on us while we're sleeping and prepares us to be awoken in the resurrection to eternal life. So that's always good to remember. This, that's, this is our Christian perspective on death, falling asleep in the hope of the resurrection. And we pray for all who have died in your mercy. That's interesting, right? So we pray for all those who fall, fell asleep with the hope of resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. For maybe those who have not, who have fallen asleep have not, without hope. Well, we want them too, Lord. Bring them in, you know? We, tell, we don't leave anybody hanging, whether you're Christian or not, basically. Whether you died with hope or no hope whether you're practicing or not, we try to swoop them right in here in this prayer. All who have died in your mercy, welcome them into the light of your face. It's a beautiful image, you know? Father, welcome the dead into the light of your face, into heaven. What happens to these near-death experiences? They die and they all start going towards the light. Well, that's the, the light of the face of God. That's our, always our prayer, always our blessing. But we pray for the dead when we do gravesides or different funeral masses too, but especially the gravesides, you know. Uh, Eternal rest grant to them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. That light is the, the light of the face of God, his love gazing upon them. That's what we're praying for right here in this mass. Welcome them, Father, into the light of your face. And then we're like, okay, we just prayed for them. Let's get back to us. <laughs> Have mercy on us all, we pray. That with the blessed, so we just prayed that the dead would be in heaven with God. And now we're like, okay, yes, yeah, we're still on the journey. We got to get there too. So we say, Have mercy on all of us, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with all the blessed apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages. So we're kind of like naming off this heavenly court here. You know? um, in sign language, it's cool, because in sign language, like uh, in a conversation, when they set up people or figures or places, it's like, you, it's like you're like making a storyboard right in front of you. And so when you do sign language at the mass, uh, from the beginning to the end of mass, it's like one giant picture that they remember in their head. And so at the very beginning, if I say that, God is right here in the middle, up top, then for, until the end of Mass, anytime I just point right there, they remember, oh, that's God right there. Now if I do the sign for the, for the Blessed Virgin Mary and I put her right here, sitting right here, anytime I point right here, they, just, they remember, oh yeah, the Blessed Virgin Mary's sitting over there. 
you know? I could put St. Joseph on her right and say, okay, Mary's there, Joseph's there. I could put, you know, all these saints all right here. I'm like, oh, the saints are over there. Oh, there's angels over here. And Mary and Joseph and the 12 apostles, right? So that's it's beautiful. The sign language is beautiful when doing the Mass because it begins to paint this heavenly picture. Oh, yeah, we're in the heavenly courts where heaven is all around us and with us. So that's what, that's what these, this kind of long prayer is just reminding us. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is with us right now during this Mass, because heaven and earth have interconnected for sure. So she's here. You know, where is she at, actually, you know? So we know, we know actually, let's say God's in the middle, Jesus is on his right, and Mary's on the right of Jesus, because the Queen Mother's always on the right of, of, her, of her son, the King, and always kind of the right hand and interceding an intercessor before the king to like paint all these people around, you know. Joseph's probably over here somewhere, you know. And that, so we're build, we're like just building the heavenly court. Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, all the blessed twelve apostles, all the saints. So it's like all of our favorite saints, all of our patron saints, the saints, Saint Vincent de Paul of this church, all the saints are there who have pleased you throughout the ages. Okay, there they are, Lord in heaven. And we're praying that we, that we would merit, by the merits of Jesus Christ, to be co-heirs to eternal life. That we would inherit eternal life and be with them in heaven. So let's kind of say, we're like saying, like, where they are, Lord, that's where we want to be. So, like, in sign language, it's cool, because, like, you paint all these people up here hanging out in heaven, and then, and then for this part, it's like we, like, grab all of us here, and they say that we would go up there. These, see, these are all little people. So all of us here, all these little people, that we would go up to heaven where they are and join them. You know? That's what we're praying for, that when we die, we'll inherit eternal life and be with them. And, may, and what are we going to do when we get there? That we may praise and glorify you with our life. And how are we going to do that? Through your Son, Jesus Christ. So everything is, uh, um, everything is through Jesus Christ, with Jesus Christ, and in Jesus Christ. And so um, that's, why, that's the, our concluding prayer. We hold up Jesus Christ, and we're, we're saying, and we're looking at the Father, so, like, any time the priest holds stuff up, everybody, like, looks at the priest and looks at the stuff, you know, but really, we're, we're talking to the Father right now, right? We said this is all dialogue, who's talking to who? We're, we're all talking to the Father. I'm speaking on all of our, our behalfs. We're holding up Jesus, and I'm looking, I'm looking at the Father. I'm not looking at you, and I'm not looking at Jesus. I'm looking at the Father, and I'm saying, Father, through him, through Jesus, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, because remember, Holy Spirit comes for unity. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. And we all say the great amen. It's called the great amen. So um, we remember the great amen. Amen is um, a covenant oath, like sealing word. I believe with my life. Everything you just prayed right there, Father, I believe with my life. Because we're in a giant covenant-making or covenant renewal ceremony at the Mass. And so we remember that, too. That first half of the Mass, we renewed our covenant oath promises with God when we, we confessed that we had sin and we rejected that sin and, and renewed our belief in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with the creed. So we renewed our covenant oath with God and the second part of making a covenant or renewing a covenant is a sacrifice, making that oath a blood oath. And so we have just now completed the sacrifice of our new covenant oath. And now we're about to do the third part and as enjoy a communion meal together by partaking of the sacrifice and sealing this, renewing this family bond that we have together. Through him, with him, in him, in the, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. All done? Just kidding. Not yet. Now, so now we're at the communion rite. So everything shifts here. 
We go from Calvary 2,000 years ago being present, now all of a sudden uh, heaven, uh, in, I mean like future heaven, like end of time heaven, when, when at the end of time when Christ and his bride of the church are together, that comes here, right here. And this altar, um, sacrificial altar, becomes the communion table, the family table, where the bride of Christ is gathered around the table and is being served by her groom, Jesus. So Jesus serves us as his bride, and once he serves us, he gives us his life. This is what John describes as going to be happening in heaven. So the whole church at the end of time, so end of time comes into this present time. So the mass transcends time. Crazy. But before we can partake of the family meal together, which is the wedding banquet of the Lamb of God with his bride, the church, we have to say our family prayer before meal. (laughs) But look at how we introduce it. These are powerful words. At the Savior's command, at Jesus, the Messiah's command, his command... Right, like remember he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I've commanded you. <laughs> Here's another command. At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching. We got this by divine teaching, by divine revelation. We didn't make this up, you know, ten guys in a room. No, divine revelation. We, by this at the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, do you dare to say the Our Father? Do you dare to say the family uh, prayer before meal? Because like, remember how powerful this prayer is. Do you dare to say God is your Father? <laughs> that you are his son or daughter? Because then you got to do the little checkup. Am I acting like a son or a daughter? <laughs> is God our Father? Am I doing, treating my brothers and sisters well if he's our Father, who is in heaven? Hallowed be thy name. Is God's name hallowed by each one of us? May your kingdom come, your will be done. You know, is that what we really want? God's kingdom to come more fully in our life, his will to be done more fully in our life on earth as it's done perfectly in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. The, the terms there for daily bread are used nowhere else. They can't really find them anywhere else. They can piece them together in other places, so they, they basically refer it to the Eucharist. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. This comes back to the teaching of Christ, who said, you know, forgive one another from your heart, or else your Heavenly Father won't forgive you. And so he teaches us to do that. Forgive our trespasses. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So this Our Father prayer that we dare to say is a deliverance prayer. We're praying for deliverance. Deliver us from evil. Free us from evil. So sometimes people say, oh, you, you, you don't say deliverance prayers. Well, I guess I can't say the Our Father. <laughs> because the Our Father is a deliverance prayer. Keep evil away from me. Free me from evil. Deliver me from evil. Be my savior right here now today. Anytime evil's bugging you, our Father prayer. There you go. And then, of course, then we pause. So lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. Then the priest prays another deliverance prayer. You know? In the first words, deliver us Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our lives so there's a blessing of peace for all of us. That by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin. So every time the priest is praying that by the help of God's mercy, all of us would be free from sin, free from slavery to sin. Sin will have no hooks in our lives. We won't be, have any, no addictions. We'll be fully free and safe from all distress. As we await the blessed hope, oh, blessed hope, that's heaven, right? As we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
And then we all say together, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, Father, now and forever. Amen. This is kind of echoing what we just said before, through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Father, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, Father. We're always uh, giving credit to God, basically, for our life. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And then we have this beautiful um, prayer that reminds us of a lot of the the first words and first things that Jesus said to his apostles after he rose from the dead. The priest prays, Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. No, so we know he did that, and John, he did that on the resurrection evening when they were clo- hiding behind locked doors, you know. And really, every time he rose and appeared to them, all those appearances, his first words were always, peace be with you, peace be with you. So we, so we repeat, uh, the peace of Jesus Christ, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, Lord, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. So we're praying again, again, for peace and unity. Like how many times we pray for peace and unity? That's at least three times right there, for unity by the Holy Spirit. And, and it's important that we're praying for peace, especially at this time, um, because, like the next word we say, the, um, the priest says, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Like you notice, I, I point here. Uh, I saw Bishop uh, Bejarano also. He pointed here when he said this part at the Mass, when he came here once. The peace of our Lord be with you always. Because this is what won us peace with God. <laughs> Reconciliation with God. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The death and resurrection, by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, our sins were forgiven. We are redeemed, bought back from slavery to sin and fear of death. We are brought into a peaceful relationship with God by the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so this, this is the peace of the Lord, the Eucharist, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is our peace. This is the true and lasting peace that Jesus speaks about, the peace that's beyond all understanding, because you could meditate on this forever. It's not that little momentary peace that just has no strife or no conflict or no war or no confrontations, you know, in the world. It's, it's this peace that, that is eternal. It has eternal consequences here. So may this peace of our Lord be with you always. And, and, we, and you guys say, and with your spirit, Father. I said, let us, and I invite, let us offer each other the sign of peace. Of course, the sign of peace is um, different for every culture, every custom. Uh, Here, we typically handshake, hug, point at you maybe. Peace be with you, Tom. Depends who, if you want to touch. It's all optional, though. You don't have to touch anybody, you know. You can just, peace be with you, peace be with you. We got that practice with COVID, you know. So, this is an op, so actually, this is an optional uh, part. All the priest really has to say is, the peace of our Lord be with you always, and you say, and with your spirit, Father, and then he can move on. He doesn't even have to invite the congregation to offer each other a sign of peace. That's the optional part that the priest can do or not do. <clears throat> then, the, we, we begin, um, called the breaking of the bread. Um, while we're just proclaiming the Lamb of God. So we've offered each other the sign of peace, and now we proclaim what John the Baptist said. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Like we're acknowledging that we believe that what John declared and proclaimed when he saw Jesus pass by, you know? Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So that's where, we're, that's where we get this from. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. The peace he's talking about, again, is peace with our Father, peace with the family, the eternal family, peace with God. 
grant us peace. And the priest, while, while we're saying those lines, the priest is breaking the host, and he says, and he breaks off that little piece, and he's going to drop now the body into the blood of Christ. And while he's dropping the body into the blood of Christ, he says a, a silent prayer. He says, may this mingling of the body and blood of Christ together, may this mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. So the priest is praying for all of us who are about to receive communion that this communion would lead us to eternal life in heaven. Beautiful, beautiful silent prayer. Then another silent prayer. Because usually we're singing Lamb of God, so it takes longer, you know? So you get all these silent prayers in here. So there's two, there's two silent prayers the priest can pray. He, has, he usually has to pray one of them, but he can pray both if he wants. The first one says this, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who by the will of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit, through your death, gave life to the world. Free me by this, your most holy body and blood, from all my sins and from every evil. Keep me always faithful to your commandments and never let me be parted from you. Beautiful prayer, huh? The other next one you can pray is, may the receiving of your body and blood, Lord Jesus Christ, not bring me to judgment and condemnation, but through your loving mercy, be for me protection in mind and body and a healing remedy. So these are, these are like the, the prayer that the priest prays before he received communion, that little silent prayer. Usually each one of us has a little silent prayer devotion that we probably pray too, you know? Um, depending on where we are in our spirituality at that time or something stands out and we like it. I used to copy ones from Padre Pio until I had to start doing this, and then I forgot the ones from Padre Pio, so I have to look them up again sometime. But <clears throat> So, praise that prayer. We're all ready. And the priest um, holds up now the body and the blood of Christ, which has been united. So this is the first sign of the resurrection of Christ being held up. So first was held up the death of Jesus Christ, now the resurrection of Jesus Christ. While he holds up the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the priest says, Behold the Lamb of God. And so the words of John the Baptist again. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. So, the, so that uh, proclamation is reminding us the, the supper of the Lamb is, is the marriage supper of the Lamb of God with his bride, the church, spoken of in Revelation about what's happening at the end of time, or what's going to happen at the end of time. When, when time is ended, judgment is done, where all believers are brought into unity with Christ and what's called uh, a marriage of Christ and his church, God and his people, a unity, a union, and so we always remember, too, that we said uh, in the past, uh, um, heaven is most, mostly described in the scriptures, uh, most often described in the scriptures with the image of marriage. Marriage is that primary image given to us to describe heaven. This celebration of marriage, this uh, joy of marriage, this dancing with marriage, this union that takes place, you know. Uh, marriage and the marriage reception, you could say, huh? Wedding and the wedding reception, that's heaven. And so this is reminding us, this, we're, we are in heaven with all the saints and angels at what's called the marriage supper of the Lamb of God with his bride, the church. So blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. So the altar is now a table, family table. And we all say together those words from scripture that, um, that centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. This roof, yeah? But only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. So we're in a very humbling spot again. We have already said that God has made us, he has made us worthy to be in his presence and minister to him. 
But now we're actually, we're, we're, it's, it's switched because now God is ministering to us. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should minister to me. See how it deepens there? But only say the word and my soul shall be healed. And so uh, the word, he does say the word. One word, and the word is the word of God, the logos of God, uh, Jesus. Yeah? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have, held, we have beheld his glory. Only say the word and my soul shall be healed. So indeed, we can kind of say this knowing that God has already said the word, given the word to us, spoken the word to us. The breath of the Holy Spirit has brought the word to us and transformed the word to us in a human nature. Uh, so we are, even though we feel we're not worthy, God has indeed made us worthy by giving us his son. So then the priest, he partakes of the body of Christ and he says a quiet prayer. May the body of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. And then uh, he drinks the precious blood of Christ and says, may the blood of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. And then goes around, gives communion to everybody who wants to receive the body of Christ, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. So we know it, so it's, op, um, so we, um, the, the basic teaching is that um, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ is present here and is present in here. So uh, whether you get a small piece or a giant piece, it's the same body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. <laughs> And so it's everything right here, body and blood, soul and divinity. So if you don't get to partake of the precious blood, what we say the precious blood, it doesn't mean you only receive the body. I need to get the blood too. Like, no, it's all right here. Body, blood, soul, and divinity is right here. Body, blood, soul, and divinity is, is right here as well. So they're kind of, they're consecrated separately to become a fuller sign of what's happening. So if we receive, if you receive both, the body and blood, uh, the host, consecrated host, and uh, received out of the chalice, it's a fuller sign of the body and the blood. But if you only get one, it's the whole thing. You know, it's okay. And if you only got a little mingling, it's still the whole thing. It's okay. You got all of Jesus right there. That's how powerful he is. Um, <clears throat> so... These are the parts we touched on Sunday at the 10 o'clock Mass. So the primary uh, responsibility for the priest is to distribute the host. The primary responsibility of the deacon is to distribute the precious blood and the chalice. So where there's a priest and a deacon, the deacon primary job is to do this one, while the priest will do this one. Someone had asked, uh, who watches online had asked a question, and they say, should you receive the host by mouth or by the hand? You know? Oh boy, here we go, huh? No. Is it really easy? Both are okay. Both are common practices in the history of our church. Some people have a preference one way or the other, and there's good argumentation for one way or the other. But I would say mostly from the practice of our church comes down to um, the culture of that church. So uh, there's, uh, I think it's... Fourth century, David probably remembers. Who's the one who had the big old teaching on make a throne for God and put Jesus there and they received by the hand, you know? Like the fourth century, do you remember? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and when um, I know like the Lebanese church, their practice, and most of the Eastern Catholic practice, or even just Eastern Orthodox, is always by mouth. Nobody, in fact, like in the Eastern churches, like the Lebanese rite, only, still only the clergy can distribute. Uh, I would say in Lebanese rite, I think still Maronite rite, only, only the priests can give the Eucharist. No lay people, I don't even think a deacon can give the Eucharist unless it's like a super emergency exception or something. Um, 
and 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 they will actually in the Lebanese right they'll actually they have a, a a big bowl with the precious blood in the middle the host around the side and the priest will actually intinct and give you both and that's where the altar rails come through you know just go down the line down the line and um, <clears throat> And so that, and that's what happens in each culture. A lot of Eastern cultures do that same thing, but a little different. So some will kind of have a, a spoon, and you have to open your mouth, and they pour, you know, kind of pour, drop the precious blood and, and body in your mouth like that. And underneath is actually like, uh, in the Lebanese, right, they have the, the little patents that they hold underneath. But in some of the Eastern Orthodox rites, they have the altar rails, and the altar servers are in charge of basically holding like a giant uh, tablecloth kind of cover apron. So if anything does fall from the spoon or anything else that falls on that, then that is uh, disposed of properly, cleaned up properly. So I would say, I would say, you know, so our church teaches it's okay either way. Probably the strongest tradition, especially Eastern Catholics and especially early church, is receiving by the mouth. Uh, I liked um, uh, 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 a hermit monk, Lebanese rite, when I was in seminary, he, he kind of taught some of the background history of their culture, that you only receive in the mouth only by the priest, because the priest is the father feeding his children. And like, what happens is, and, like, and, and he described it like, when you're cooking in the kitchen, the children running in, you might like, hey, taste this, and, you, and they, feed, they feed them, you know? So they're with their hands, they take their food, put it in your mouth, you know, and they feed them by their hands. So like, it's like, that's what happened at the Last Supper. Like, Jesus didn't, they didn't have utensils, like, here, take this bread. Here, take this. Here, dip this right here. You know, like, it's getting all over people's hands and everything and intermixed. And, and, and you know, and he, and he could. He might. Uh, that's, this, this priest, he, his, one of his arguments was, uh, this is where, where it's easy to recognize Judas. Because Jesus said, who, Judas, the one who will betray me is the one who, who dips his hand in the dish with, with me. Whereas it would have been the job of the father to take the bread, dip it, and feed each of the children first, and then they all eat normally. Whereas Judas kind of rejected being fed by Jesus and fed himself, you know. Um, so, so officially, our church says either way is okay. Probably the strongest tradition for most of the cultures, Eastern and Western Catholics is to receive by the mouth. The most important thing is if you receive by the mouth that you open your mouth <laughs> wide and stick out your tongue and stay there. And don't move until the host is in your mouth. You know, don't go forward and try to bite. You know, you don't have to do anything but just let, but receive. It's interesting, you could tell like what people struggle with just how, how they receive communion, I think, you know. Because a lot of people have a problem just being vulnerable and open and just receiving. They try to lick or something. They go, I'm like, where do I put that? You know? Or are they are they coming in there? You know? <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah. Sometimes they'll come up and they go, yes. So I put it in your mouth or in your hand. You know, I'm putting it in the mouth probably, but so. For whatever reason, people, it's, it's just a hard task for some people. But um, most priests I know don't have any problem as long as you're staying still because, and not biting or trying to lick their fingers, you know? <laughs> uh, that's why I use the big host now. Three inches away from the, from the teeth and the, and the tongue, you know, it's great. <laughs> um, so, so there's that one. Um, of course, there's music being played while we're receiving, and this is like one of the highest points of, of our Mass, this communion with, with Jesus Christ, and so it should be a softer music that kind of leads, even an instrumental maybe, that leads into a silent silence where we're awestruck at this communion and union that has just taken place with God. Uh, and all the musical parts of the Mass should be really focused on or supporting the theology the understanding behind that section or part of the Mass. So the music at this point, the words, should be saying something about our union, our communion with God, or God giving himself to us, or us giving ourselves to God, something that's deepening our understanding of this whole section of the Mass. Is there, um, 
Well, this is a really short concluding rite. So this is the end, kind of section three. And we'll just um, finish because it's super, super quick to finish. And then we'll do questions. So from here, this, now the priest, he, when he's um, finishing and he's cleaning the vessels, there's a silent prayer that he prays. Uh, he says, what has passed our lips as food, O Lord? May we possess this in purity of heart, that what has been given to us in time may be our healing for eternity. It's beautiful, huh? So he's praying that prayer, cleaning up here, puts everything on the side for the altar service to take to the side table. And then he usually sits down, there's a moment of silence, and we're just kind of all awestruck together in that moment of silence, experiencing union with God. And at the end of that silence, the priest kind of breaks the silence by saying, let us pray. We all stand up, get ready to pray. He prays the prayer after communion. It's one of the proper prayers. Here's one from the 20th Sunday in Ordinary Time. In each of these prayers, remember, we're supposed to kind of summarize this part of the Mass or what has just happened or what is about to take place. So this one, for example, summarizes what has just happened. Made partakers of Christ through these sacraments, we humbly implore your mercy, Lord, that conformed to his image on earth, we may merit also to be his co-heirs in heaven, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. So it's like, this is making us in union with God here on earth, this sacrament, you know, let it happen completely so we can be with him in heaven. So a lot of prayers for heaven, <laughs> salvation. Uh, we all say amen. And then uh, we have to stir it up one more time, pump each other up one more time. We're not done yet, all right? The, we say the Lord be with you and with your spirit. And may, the, may now there's a, there's, remember we said during, at the beginning of each four sections of the mass, there's an optional place where the priest can do a quick explanation or something. So you notice this is where I've been the last month or so maybe. Now this is where I, I remind us of what we're about to do. I say, now we're all about to be sent out into the world to continue the mission and presence of Jesus Christ, right? Healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, driving out demons, one heart at a time, right? One blessing at a time. So you can do, so this is that point of the mass where you can do that quick kind of uh, explanation. And then the priest said, then I say, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, it's important that remember we've said uh, the blessing um, is, uh, is good and powerful to just say, I bless you or God bless you. Because any time we even just say bless you, uh, we're saying, you know, we're speaking life into a person. But the true understanding of blessing is not just saying bless you even though that's good in a general sense, but actually speaking the blessing. Peace be with you is a blessing, you know, or God bless you with peace. So for example, the, the fuller sense of an understanding of blessing, um, the, the better, um, there's, there's different optional blessings usually re, re, reserved for solemn celebrations, like so called different solemn, solemn blessings. Um, Let's see if we can find one. Okay. Well, here's one for Easter time. And it's a threefold blessing before the general blessing. So these are actually specific ones. So the, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us bow our head and pray for God's blessing. And then the priest begins to speak the blessings. May God, who by the resurrection of his only begotten son, was pleased to confer on you the gift of redemption and adoption give you gladness by his blessing. So he's blessing with gladness. And we all say, amen. And that's like, a, I receive, I accept and receive that blessing. May he, who, by whose redeeming work you have received the gift of everlasting freedom, make you heirs to an eternal inheritance. May God bless you with eternal life. That's a beautiful one. And may you, who have already risen with Christ in baptism through faith, 
by living in a right manner on this earth, be united with him in the homeland of heaven. So really just another, another blessing for eternal life. And may the blessing of Almighty God, for the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, come down upon you and remain with you forever. So, that, so like these kind of solemn blessings give us a more fuller sense of the traditional biblical understanding of blessing by actually speaking a blessing into our lives before we get the general blessing. And may God bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go home and watch a movie. The mass is over, finally, you know? Now, this is the, this is the deacon's part, right? Go, there's different uh, options for what you can say. Go forth, the mass is ended, is like a, the basic one. But we have to we remember we're, um, the literal interpretation of the Latin it says, go, you are sent. Because the word mass, misa, means sent or sending. So, so it's, it's the, I wish they would just, you know, they, we did this new translation here, 2010 or whatever, with all these literal prayers now, but they didn't translate that last section literally. They still said, go, the mass is ended. But that, that mass, is, mass is not the translation for Misa. Mass means sending. It's a literal translation. Go, you are sent. We're sent on a mission to continue the ministry and presence of Jesus. How do you say the Latin, Dave? Do you remember? Ita, ite, misa, est? Something like that. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Yeah, so literally it means go, you are sent. Uh, and it's, it's supposed to con- convey that, that, that mission sense to us, that we're missionary disciples of Jesus Christ. We are on a mission. We came here to kind of get filled up, and now we're sent. Or we finished our boot camp and our training, and now we have orders to war, <laughs> you know, an assignment somewhere. You're sent back to your assignment post out there in the world, you know. Um, uh, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. I've been filled up with the love of God. Now I'm empowered and equipped to go out there and bring it out there. Thanks be to God I've received the peace that Jesus Christ offered. I can go out there and bring it to Jesus Christ, you know. Um, and then there's the, the, uh, the song as we process out. And remember, when the priest goes out, it's really just a sign of all of us going out, all of us going out into the world to proclaim um, so the, so we'll use this more lively, more pump you up, because, you know, that's why we said at the very end again, the Lord be with you and with your spirit, we've got to pump each other up, because, like, it's kind of like, you know, when you go on a retreat, and you're going to go back down off the retreat, and you're like, I'm going to go back to the real world again now, you know? Like, here, there was, hopefully there was so much love that we experienced, you know? And I was like, i got to go back out there, you know? It's like, yeah, you've been filled up with the light of Christ, sent out into the darkness. <laughs> Woo! So that's the end of our fourth part. We want, is there any questions, remaining questions? Uh, Kevin. Uh-huh. St. Cyril of Jerusalem. I'm just saying it so it gets on the recording. Sure. 
So, so the, from the question before, I'm just repeating for, because this, the person who asked me is watching on live stream right now, you know, so they want to know the full answer. So, uh, so the communion on, what's, the question was, what's the right way? And so the church, so the right, the, the universal normal right way is communion on the tongue, but there's an indult or an exception to receive on the hand as well. So, in other words, they're both right. Or they're both okay. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so St. Paul, how did he learn about the Last Supper? He says that he received, he received that understanding of what happened there straight from a revelation from the risen Jesus Christ. So when Jesus Christ appeared to him on that road, and after, after the great vision, he was blind for three days, he received an incredible amount of information or teaching or visions he doesn't say exactly what happened, but other, in other letters, he, he basically, for that, for the Last Supper, and for the words that he uses for the Last Supper, he says he received directly from Jesus Christ. And then he went about preaching that for a number a time, and eventually made his way back to Jerusalem and conversed with the apostles there. He said he met with Peter, I think, for 14 days, met the, one of the apostles, James, I think it was, um, and just kind of sharing with them what he's been doing and saying, making sure... He was doing it right. But everything he got was straight, first and foremost, from Jesus Christ. And he kind of confirmed it later on with the apostles after that. But <clears throat> okay, wonderful. Uh, well, but the, just before the final blessing, thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Peggy, for recording, live streaming, and leading the adoration beforehand. And we'll just close with a blessing together. The Lord be with you. And the Almighty God continue to bless you with peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.